Hi, good afternoon, welcome. I am Rebecca Atkinson. I am the Director of Programs and Partnerships for John Jay's Future of Public Safety Initiative. And I wanted to welcome you to our panel on the role of light, blight, and green space in public safety, where we're trying to reinforce our theme that healthy communities are clean, green, and livable. And at this time, I would like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Jeff Butts. Jeff is a research professor and the director of the Research and Evaluation Center here at John Jay. Previously, he was a research fellow with Chapman Hall at the University of Chicago and director of the program on youth justice at the Urban Institute in DC. Jeff graduated from the University of Oregon and earned his PhD from the University of Michigan. So with that, Jeff, I will turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, showing up. The, the last session ended a little late, so we are starting a little late, uh, but we'll try to make it uh, endlessly entertaining. That's our goal. We are here today to talk about the role of physical improvements and environmental design in facilitating public safety. And I think this is a very important area because um, those of you who know me know that I'm prone to complain about policies that focus exclusively on individual behavior, as if the solutions to society's problems were finding the people who are prone to be violent and stopping them either by helping them or controlling their behavior. If we only focus on individual solutions, we are basically excusing the society, the policymakers who control the direction of society, we are excusing them from creating the uh, environment and conditions that continue to cause these problems. But having said that, where do you go from there? And the obvious place to go is, oh, let's fix society. Let's fix the economy. Let's solve the housing problem. Um, and everyone throws their hands up and says, you're dreaming. Um, I personally went on that same journey um, when I was 19 years old. I spent most of my day reading Marxist theory because I was going to be a Marxist because they had all the answers. And about 18 months later, I thought, this is, this is kind of crazy. This is never going to work. Um, and so I shifted into the justice arena to try to do something more practical. And that was 40 years ago. And I'm still struggling with that same battle of trying to combine evidence and data with policies and practice and community resources in a way that facilitates a healthier, stronger community for everyone with equity and opportunity and justice. And it's a long-term battle. I think someone this morning uh, was talking about we can't really hope to see that battle end, but we have to continue to see progress and every generation has that responsibility. So if there's a, is there something between solving all the individual problems versus solving all the structural, large-scale societal problems? And I think that's where you end up focusing on micro neighborhoods, environment, the conditions of that people encounter at, uh, out on the street in the neighborhood. Um, and if we can establish that that actually helps produce public safety, it provides encouragement for those who would only think about big solutions and and starts to convince people that there is another way to pursue safety and justice without just fixing the individual problems in the community. So I think this is a very important area. It's growing. Uh, we fortunately have some folks with us who know a lot about that and we're going to hear from them and after that we'll do some questions and answer and then do Q&A with you. Uh, so first I want to introduce uh, Michelle Kondo who's a research social scientist with the USDA Forest Service. Uh, she has a PhD in urban design and planning from the University of Washington. My wife always tells me I should have been in urban design because when we're walking around New York, I'm always complaining about things. I say, this would be more efficient if they just put the street over there. So I have very little training, but great interest. So please. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to everyone. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, as, as you mentioned, I work for the U.S. Forest Service, and, and a lot of people are like, what? Like, I didn't realize there was a Forest Service and or I didn't realize that they hired scientists that are, and they have stations in, in cities and urban areas and scientists who are working on, um, you know, the role of urban natural resources in um, you know, social issues more broadly. So I'm one of very few of Forest Service scientists who do uh, research in, in the area of, of public health and, and violence prevention. 
but I am stationed in Philadelphia and I serve the public there and I cannot do my job without addressing these issues and thinking about you know, neighborhoods and trees as part of neighborhoods um, and the role that they either you know, are, uh, are sort of continuing and or interrupting the cycle of, of violence. So how much should I speak? Go until <laughs> you're, you want to stop and then we'll mix it up. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm here at an exciting time. My, uh, my agency has uh, just released a, a you know, request for proposals uh, for the um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act funding that is gonna come through our agency through the urban and, and community uh, forestry um, uh, program. So we have $1.5 billion that we will be distributing to um, urban forestry programs and monitoring and evaluation that goes along with it in under-resourced and disadvantaged communities and neighborhoods specifically, right? Um, so, you know, the, the work must be done there. Uh, and this comes from a lot of, of research and sort of uncovering the things we already know that, uh, that investments, especially in, in natural resources and trees and maintaining, you know, health, healthy environments has been um, left out of so many urban communities and um, it's time to disrupt that, that pattern. Uh, so this okay. is an exciting time. And All right. I'll pass it on. Next we'll hear from Renita Francoise, who I got to know, did I miss it? Francoise? No. Francois. <laughs> and I just told her. Oh well. Um, he practiced it and he did that. <laughs> And I got to know Renita when she worked at the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Now she is a, uh, the Chief Strategy Officer with Tides Advocacy. Um, and she has an MBA from Cornell. And we were hired or appointed to be the evaluator for an initiative here in New York called the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety, which, which Renita coordinated. And how, how would you describe our relationship at that time? It was... Contentious, <laughs> spicy. No, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm just kidding. All right, I'm gonna put us all out of our misery because I, I know it's the afternoon. You ate lunch. You had cookies and coffee and all of that. It's time to wake up. So I'm Renita, as Jeff said, Francois. Um, currently, uh, I'm the chief strategy officer at Tides Advocacy, a 501c4 fiscal sponsor supporting progressive advocacy groups. That is not relevant for today because today I'm in my old bag as Renita Francois, uh, formerly of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice in New York City, as he said. So uh, in my time at MACJ, Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, I'm not gonna say these long things again, so keep up with my acronyms. Um, I was the Executive Director of MAP, Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety, which was a place-based initiative, community uh, safety initiative, supporting 15 NYCHA, New York City Housing Authority developments across uh, New York City. So as a part of MAP and working with those NYCHA developments, uh, we worked on a program model that was essentially individual, communal, and environmental, meaning focusing on the small number of people who commit violence, the community that surrounds them, and the environment in which they live and dwell. Um, the importance of that initiative was that it brought together agencies who are not tr traditionally considered a part of violence prevention, community safety, so pretty much any agency you could think of down to the Department for the Aging, um, and sort of tried to come up with a role for them in supporting communities to essentially determine for themselves what safety looks like. What does that have to do with blight, light, and green space? A lot, because the environmental aspect of that initiative is saying essentially, we can program folks to death, put them in all the CBT that we want, do these um, you know, different sort of CBI type of models, but if they're essentially coming back to the same community, the same environment, then how do we expect the work that they do internally to be sustainable? We cannot expect for that to happen. So as the government, um, ambitiously so, I think we embarked on the challenge of trying to um, create community with folks who have essentially been estranged from their government for a very long time. Uh, when I think about 
um, the place-based aspect of our in initiative. I think it had such an, an interesting relationship um, to the concept of ownership. Because essentially, if we're talking about violence prevention, we're talking about urban centers, like New York, we're talking about black and brown communities. Most of uh, the communities we work with in New York City have black folks, and we know black folks are stolen people on a stolen land. And then we come in with this initiative and say, we want the community to play a role in creating safety and owning or sharing accountability with us in what happens in a community when we've told them over generations that they don't own anything. So you want people to exercise ownership and accountability over a space that they do not own. So how do you do that? How do you convince people to be in partnership with you in this way? So that was essentially what we were doing as a part of MAP. We got a team of folks, including folks that worked in the mayor's office, folks that worked at um, nonprofit and community-based organizations to work together to recruit a team of residents um, that were facilitated by a group of organizers that we paid for as the government in partnership with research institutions like John Jay to look at the results of our work. Um, and essentially we came together to work at a very hyper-local micro level because New York City is New York City, but all these communities have their own identity, different cultures, um, some of them are in gentrified areas, so now we're talking about cultural conflict, the culture in a place before folks come in and decide it's trendy and hip to live there along with the folks who uh, have been there for years and years, and like, how do you make those two things work in the same space? So as a part of this initiative, um, a team that we work with facilitated um, the communities through this process of coming up with what they felt impacted their community safety. So I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> truncate seven years of work into a little spiel, it's very hard, but essentially uh, the organizers uh, took those residents through a series of, of training with support from our office on placemaking, placekeeping, organizing, mobilizing, advocacy, how to read data. Um, at one point, you know, we we worked with residents, they were like on our hiring panels for who we hired. Like we really wanted to, uh, for folks to feel that ownership over the initiative and over the work we did. Um, and we essentially gave them money so that they could decide um, how they wanted to spend it to affect safety in their neighborhoods. And a lot of that was around manipulation of the physical space. How, we, how they could create a feeling of ownership and the feeling of uh, community in their development. So if you are a city employee or you work for NYCHA, you understand there are rules that govern federal property, which is essentially what it is. Um, so you can't just do stuff because it's nice to do or because people want to do it because government is not set up in that way. You don't get to do what you want to do on government property because you live there. You can't. Um, and so for us, the residents worked with us to do things like take down fencing. Who wants to live in a place that looks like they're in prison? Um, to find out, you know, that a regular person should be able to call up an agency and ask, why is scaffolding surrounding my building for the past five years? And I don't see any work being done ever. Um, local laws govern that. They determine when scaffolding has to go up for whatever reason. There's a loose brick. There's an air conditioner that hasn't been fixed. So scaffolding is there. But the condition that it creates in the physical space is one where people feel like they're literally trapped and in prison. They don't have access to recreational space. Um, they can't get around the community in a way, in accessible way. They don't have signage. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, Immigrant families that live in some of these communities, sometimes the information is only written in English. You wanna talk about garbage in the developments, they have garbage chutes that are the size of something built in 1950, in 2020, 2023. Our garbage, American garbage, don't look like it looked in 1950. So don't ask folks why they're not doing their best to shove it down a garbage chute. Um, essentially, we are trying to acknowledge the fact that a place, uh, looking and feeling a certain way can give the message to the people who live there that nobody cares about them, nobody cares about their condition. And so we want people to behave or to you know, dis dispose of their garbage or function however we deem socially acceptable, but we don't want them to live in socially acceptable conditions. Make it make sense. Um, so as a part of MAP, we work together with residents to be their advocates, um, to help them get the information that they needed to navigate some of these systems and processes, and ultimately for them to realize the vision that they had for their developments on these small scales. Bureaucracy is very slow. It's set up to move very slow. We weren't moving mountains overnight. We did a, a light study. We put all these light towers in the developments to mix 
reaction. You know, some folks are like, I don't want to smell a generator or hear a generator all night or have a light flashing in my window. And some people were just happy that they could see. But what it led to ultimately after years and years and years and millions of dollars was the city saying, oh, this works to reduce crime. Let's make a permanent investment in upgraded lighting. So the fact that it took all that to get the investment in uh, public, in uh, permanent lighting, you know, we can debate that all day long. That's what it took, dealing with bureaucracy to do it. Um, but as, as MAP, as the MAP initiative, and ultimately as the Office of Neighborhood Safety, which we became later, um, a part of our role was to help folks um, really express themselves through the physical environment in their development and really have a role in directing how resources that are meant to support community safety, community wellness, community uplift, um, should function the way should controlled by the people who live there and now by us in the mayor's office. Those are two great examples from MAP um, for me were that lighting study, because at the time I was one of the people criticizing it. I remember walking by and hearing gasoline engines and some of the towers had NYPD logos on them and I thought this feels like a prison. It's really spicy. Yeah. Um, but if you hadn't done that and you hadn't, was it Aaron Chalton did the evaluation? If you hadn't done the, a rigorous evaluation where you could show that it has a a measurable effect on safety, all that would have happened would have, they may have still done the experiment and put up all the light towers and if they hadn't evaluated it, they would have heard all the complaints, not been able to prove the benefits and those investments wouldn't have happened. So sometimes it takes that, even though I was a critic uh, at the time and I still think they had a horrible presence when they were installed. I was a critic. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. A great example for MAP, which I really enjoyed, the first MAP meeting I went to was at NYPD in the Comstat room. And I remember saying to someone at the time, this feels like showbiz to me. It was all the white shirts and the badges in the front of the room and everyone was um, genuflecting to the, the officers and talking about how great things were. And I, but then MAP and the team um, created their own version of that called NSTAT or Neighborhood Stat, which I assume was the name was designed to reflect upon Comstat or signal familiarity. Um, I didn't make up the name, so uh, yeah, that's what they was trying to do. Yeah, but the, <laughs> when I went to some of those meetings, a huge room, sometimes a big round table, and you have residents, you have NYCHA residents at the table, you've got nonprofit people at the table, and some uniforms who were probably made to go there by the command structure, but they would sit in the room and listen to the residents talk about what it was like to live in their NYCHA building, and they would get to things like garbage chutes and rodents and mm -hmm. all kinds of other stuff. Um, and just to see city officials sit quietly and listen to residents was a powerful thing. So that's not explicitly about space, but it turns into discussions of space because you got the people right there who are living in those, those uh, neighborhoods and those buildings. So. I, I just will say one more thing on the light study. Y'all see how ridiculous this is? You gotta spend millions of dollars to prove something <laughs> that I'm sure if I asked y'all right now, you'd be like, yeah, all you have to do is fix the lights that haven't been changed in 60 years. That's like common sense, but that's, that's, how, that's how your government works. Yeah. You spend millions of dollars to prove something everybody knows. Mm -hmm. Also, you walk into some of these apartments and we're talking about the quality of the space and the the environment and planting more trees. And meanwhile, this woman has a hole in her bathroom ceiling with water running out constantly and NYCHA's not fixing it. So there, yeah, there's certain uh, hierarchies of urgencies and problems. Um, but I really enjoyed working on that with you, I'll say. Um, uh, next we have Charlie Brannis, who, are you still chair? Yep. Okay, chair of the department, pardon me? Sadly. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> Uh, he's chair of the Department of Epidemiology at Columbia University and his PhD is from Johns Hopkins and he has uh, engaged in some of this research, uh, tried to show the benefits of environmental improvement in space. Um, and I think even though it's easy for people, and you hear it all the time, focus on place and people, uh, persons and places, but in a general criminology uh, discussion, what that often turns into is places because we can predict now where the criminals will be, so let's focus on those places, which is a very different conversation than what we usually mean by people and places. So tell us about your work and can you hear me? I think it's off. Is it on? Oh, now it's on. So definitely not talking about place-based policing. 
talking about place-based change to structures um, that, that Renita was just talking about quite a bit. And as a new New Yorker, I got to say, what is with the scaffolding? I'm just going <laughs> to put that out there. So um, never gets done, right? Five years is, uh, I think that's a low ball estimate. So I've been around apparently 10, 15 years sometimes, et cetera. Anyway, but that's a kind of place-based change. If you, if you restructure the places people live in in positive ways, you will get benefit from that, not simply uh, in the short term when you do that, that restructure in the weeks that follow, but in the years that follow for a lot of these hard structures. And by the way, it's not just gonna benefit, I guess, folks that you would call high risk or vulnerable, I was in the prior conversation, in prior discussion about that, but it's gonna benefit everybody who comes through there uh, over the course of a very, very long time. So my background, I'll just give you a little bit of my background, is that, um, so I, I am an epidemiologist. Uh, I saw patients uh, for a period uh, and um, was working with fire departments, seeing folks who had been very traumatically injured and um, began to ask the question of, well, is this all we got? We're, are we only gonna be there when this happens? And what are we gonna do to move upstream a little bit? And had the opportunity to work a little bit with uh, communities and doing some community outreach from, from the clinical setting and from hospitals. And it turned out that that was having an impact, but it was limited. Uh, you know, we were having an impact on a couple dozen kids and it was good, but we really wanted to do something broader. And at that moment, this is in the city of Philadelphia, at that moment, uh, we decided, we sort of threw our hands up as folks at, coming out of the university and the medical centers, there was multiple universities and medical centers in the city at the time. We threw our hands up and we said, we don't know what to do. We should go to the community and ask them. What do they think we should do, right? They are experiencing this problem on a day-to-day -day basis. And after doing a lot of, um, focus groups, other qualitative, just getting to know folks and so forth through rec centers, through community gardens, through their block captains and so forth, the, something came back. People did say, yes, you got to work with kids and you got to improve things for the kids and, and do this and that. But people kept on pointing back to that abandoned house, that abandoned building and that vacant lot that had vegetation that was taller than they were. Mm -hmm. They were afraid of it, right? They were saying, someone's gonna come out of there. So people were afraid. People would cross the street or walk, in, frankly, walk in traffic to avoid that vacant lot. Or they thought the building was gonna fall down. I remember one mother telling us a story. I said, oh, it's so great your kids can play on the sidewalk in front of your house. And she said to me, oh no, my house is down there, but do you see the house next to it? Do you see the bricks that are falling off of it? I'm not gonna let my children play on the sidewalk near my house because of that. So these are the kind of things that really struck us. And, and we decided the city had a couple of homegrown programs, particularly for greening vacant lots at the time. Later, there was a program for doing uh, basic changes to dilapidated and abandoned housing uh, in the city. These are all coming out of, again, community members and neighbors saying that we're fed up. And frankly, at the time, those began because the neighbors that were just so fed up with it just went ahead and did it. They greened the first vacant lot. They went and shifted the windows. They got in the house and changed the windows, changed the door, cleaned the front of the house to make sure that it didn't look like that anymore. Those then became programs that some groups in the city, uh, like the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, took up. That's when Michelle and I met each other and started talking about this, brought in the Forest Service, federal agency, right? Uh, that's charged with this, has a station in Philadelphia, but many other cities too, including New York and then brought in the Centers for Disease Control and the NIH. Remember, I'm, I'm an epidemiologist, and we did get funding around this to do hundreds of these sorts of properties, actually almost a 1,000. Uh, actually, if you add in the other cities now, New Orleans, Detroit, Flint, and I'm forgetting one, um, and Youngstown, Ohio, if you add in those other cities, there was other funding that came in federally to do two things. It's what I call win-win science is to change the places and spaces to see what happens and what will happen, particularly we were interested in gun violence, and we did find a very significant reduction in gun violence, uh, but then also 
that brought, these communities all were asking for this stuff. Of course, all the communities were tested. Do they really want this to happen in their communities? The vast majority did. So th this federal scientific money came to the communities to, so we could learn something about it, so perhaps it could be transplanted somewhere else, but also provided those resources for the, for the short term. I'm gonna say one last thing and then I'm gonna stop because <laughs> otherwise I'll just keep talking about this. So the, the sorts of place-based changes that we thought about from the very beginning in cities like Philadelphia, New Orleans, and Detroit were not, I say this a lot to New Yorkers, were not the high line. That is not the kind of place-based change I'm talking about. There's broad things that what I will call are destination amenities for folks who do not live there and perhaps, I know you all know the history of the High Line better than I do, perhaps will displace long-term residents, multi-generational residents. The sorts of changes I'm talking about are what one reporter called building the park of a thousand pieces. Making little changes, pocket parks, abandoned dilapidated buildings one by one in communities in very simple ways, structural changes to those buildings that will change. You can imagine if you're on a block with 40 such properties and 20 of them uh, are abandoned like this, and you can do 10 of them in a two to three week period, that's gonna change people's day to day experience uh, overnight, really, I, I, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but in a couple of weeks, it's gonna change people's day to day experience. So this is the sort of thing, and these were designed to be inexpensive so that folks do not get displaced from their neighborhoods and get to stay and use the new amenities that are being provided to that, to that neighborhood in that space, and I will stop. So Michelle, um, it, it probably would strike a lot of people in a strange way to look at an agenda for something about safety and justice and they see someone's here from the Forest Service. Um, but how deep do these ideas go? When we talk about green and clean, um, are there, I, I know the obvious reason for that, but I can also imagine you encounter people who say, well, of course safe neighborhoods are greener because the people who live there make it green, that they reverse the causation and think you can't just make it green and have safety follow. Safety, de safety generates the quality of the environment. H how do you contend with those arguments? Well, uh, so, you know, you, you can't uh, have a community transformed, you know, through vacant lots, cleanup, or, you know, tree planting, or other sort of neighborhood safety inter interventions. Well, I suppose you, you can. You can hire people to just come in and do it. Um, but we're finding actually in studies that, that I have um, led and taken part in that um, having an element of, of community engagement and ownership in those transformations has differing effects than when you just hire somebody to come in and do it, right? Um, so, you know, we have a study of uh, just lots of green, you know, uh, abandoned property, you know, cleaning and greening program in Youngstown, Ohio, we found that the vacant lots that had been, you know, cleaned and greened by community members turned into community gardens, um, and all of that, uh, you know, we saw more significant reductions in, in violent crimes as opposed to at the contractor green lots where we found it was mostly property crimes we found reductions in. Um, so I'm in involved in a lot of research now, look, really diving into that. So what is this element, uh, uh, you know, of this ad added <laughs> element of you know community um, ownership over these these neighborhood improvements in terms of, of violence prevention and, and how is that all working? Um, uh, you know, people coming together to work to to improve their neighborhoods and and giving them the resources that they need, capacity that they need, um, you know, helping to build capacity there uh, is and can have I think you know can you know, uh, increase <laughs> greatly the, the benefits we see in, in, in violence prevention. It's through, um, right now we, we think it's, it's through, you know, increase to improve community and neighbor relationships, um, feelings about, you know, how, you know, if, they, if we see our neighbors taking care of our neighborhoods, that it sort of uh, spreads. Um, and, uh, I mean, mental health stress, right? It's, stressful living in environments that um, look like they're they are not cared for. Um, so I think some of these, the, re the relationship building that is required in, you know, and that we give space to in, in the way we imp implement programs
programs and through our nonprofit partners who are really taking lead in, in developing these methods. Um, you know, we are trying to give funding to those those efforts and those methods right now. Um, so. Yeah, so it's accepted wisdom, I guess, in the field that it's not the fact that trees and leaves and green improves the community. It's the having organized community residents to work together to do that or broken or abandoned buildings sure. and um, that it's that benefit. And I think that insight, uh, Renita, was central to MAP, if I'm remembering correctly. Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, I don't know how many research folks are in the room, but those, those little wonky terms, collective efficacy, cohesion, you know, these are, these are the things that might be bubbling up uh, for you. It's, it's plain and simple. It's like people working together on something that they believe is theirs and that they, they can touch and see and feel, put their own hands to and actually have resources to support it. Of course, it's going to change the dynamic of the space. If you are from a community and I, as a part of MAP, we've worked in communities that have significant challenges with territoriality, places like Brownsville, um, the South Bronx. How do you build that with people who are like, yeah, we're in a, we could take a whole five minute loop and be around the whole neighborhood, but I can't go across the street over here and I can't do this over there. How do you build community connection in a community that might be divided, where people might see themselves as ops and not as folks living, breathing the same air in the same um, community. So for us, I think that was probably the most significant part of the initiative. It wasn't necessarily you know, the building of the garden or um, you know, the painting of the mural. It was the byproduct of that, the people who were invested in it and the norms that are created around it. Because I cannot go into a community as a government employee and say, you can't do this on this space. This is the safe area. This is where we, do, we act like this over here. Those norms are generated from within the community. The community determines what's acceptable in certain areas. Um, and so I feel like we saw a lot of that. We saw a lot of people saying, you know, this is not a space for insert whatever negative activity you want to put in there, but it's a space for this. This is where our kids play. This is where we're going to, you know, um, pave the space and put in planters and uh, get a shipping container that we open up during the summer and and make a little summer stage out of. People did that in Harlem. That's what they wanted to do. So now it's it's not the uh, shady spot where they where they sell drugs. It's the spot that we activate in the summer when we don't have anywhere to go and we create our own little festival style experience. The people in the community dictate that. Or, you know, we never had, we did so many nighttime outdoor events in neighborhoods that were supposed to be violent, um, supposed to be shooting prone. We never had an incident. We're outside all the time, and nothing was happening outside while we was outside. So I think that there is definitely something to say about this ownership concept and how you engender that kind of feeling, how you help to naturally create that and now not just tell people, okay, now is yours. Go and make it safe. So if it's not safe, we can blame you for it. It's not really about that. Um, it's really about letting people have the freedom to decide this looks like an area where we want to have a serenity garden because it's closed off by the landlord, NYCHA. However, we have an open air substance abuse challenge in this neighborhood and this is where people are disposing of their needles. We want to take that fencing down and create, it a, create a serenity garden. We want to invite nonprofits and city agencies to come and activate this space to talk about healthy living and well-being and we promise to tend to the space. And y'all are going to give us a stipend to tend to the space. That happened in the South Bronx. That's what they wanted to do with the space. It was theirs. Um, so it wasn't about, you know, if, if I'm going to be upset that somebody kicked over the planter or vandalized the planter, it's them. The aunties is outside ranting about who touched their planter. That's theirs. It's not mine. Um, and that's the feeling that we want to create, not just that people are tenants in a community, but they are members of the community and they live there they work there, they get a say in how it operates and functions, and they lay down the unofficial law of what's going to happen there. Um, and I think that for New York City, it's a place where that can be particularly challenging, going back to that point of like culture and the culture that's naturally in a place and the culture of the people who have been there for a time. It shouldn't be that you have Ingersoll houses in Fort Greene and now that everybody's, Fort Greene is trendy, got a little Target 
situation over there, a restaurant, now that it's like that, certain stuff is not acceptable. And the people who live in that community need to conform to a certain way of being. Or in some of these places where it's like, no, you can't play music dialogue. What you mean? You know, it said the bachata been pumping for three decades out these windows. Mm -hmm. And here y'all come talking about what, how we could play our music. That's not, if we're not gonna create space for people who are coming in and people who live there to try to build community together, we're not doing the right thing. We're not doing the right thing. We can't let, um, you know, I've been here for five minutes and because I have money, I get to dictate how the space operates. That's never gonna work. So as governments, as stakeholders in, um, for a, I'm speaking to the New York City perspective, obviously, because that's what I know. Um, but for the people who um, live here, who make decisions about the city as a whole, you know, there has to be this shared acknowledgement that you run the city, but we run this little piece of thing right here. And so, you know, we have to come together to determine what, um, you know, what the what the rules of engagement are going to be. And I think there's friction there because we don't do it like that. We say, you know, oh, this group of people with money is coming in, it's going to be like that, and y'all don't say nothing about it, and you don't do nothing. Or we're not going to invest here until we see people with money coming to live here. That We can no longer function like that as a, as a city if we want New York City to remain uh, the place that we love. If we come here for a certain vibe and then we displace the vibe, <laughs> we, get, we don't like the vibe once we live there. So I'll stop my, my rant. <clears throat> that was not a rant. <clears throat> if we could in indulge in a little research talk for a second. Um, Don't worry, y'all. I'm not going to let them put you on the <laughs> And There are some researchers in the audience, so I know I'm not losing everybody. Um, but when we talk about the problem of all policymakers want to focus on individual level interventions, either therapeutic or enforcement based, that's not just a question of theory. It's not just because they believe all problems are solvable at the individual level. It's because the research community has trained policymakers to respond like Pavlov's dog to the phrase, evidence-based, it's evidence-based, this program's evidence-based. And you talk to any politician today and they all know that phrase now. They don't know what it means, but they think it means somebody with a PhD somewhere wrote something and was complimentary toward the program and has some numbers and tables and charts and it looks persuasive to them so they accept it. But what evidence-based really means is it has whatever intervention you're measuring has lived up to a standard of statistical precision and reliability that you can say this intervention will achieve the outcome you're after and I can pretty much guarantee you that it will fall, the outcome will fall between these two points on a scale. And if these two points are valuable, um, you know, the lower bound, the upper bound, it's gonna bounce around in there, but it's gonna be centered on this value and I can pretty much predict how to produce that outcome. That's an evidence-based program. But the ability to say that it's gonna only bounce around within that small margin is dependent on two things. One is the actual inherent variability of the outcome, so things can bounce around a lot. The other thing it depends on is the number of measurement units that you're using to establish that. So when you, when you hear about politics and they do a poll of which idiot you're gonna vote for in the future, um, that number never, if you look at the bottom of the table, it never says it's based on a sample of five people. It always says 800, 1100, and that's because you need that many units in order to start narrowing in on that range. So back to public safety, you can get that range with that many units if you're measuring people and their changing behavior. So if you do therapy with someone and you have a bunch of people, like 60 people who get a therapeutic program and then you follow up to see how many got rearrested, you can get pretty good tight statistical results from that. But I don't know if anyone's doing studies on greening 60 neighborhoods compared to 60 neighborhoods just like them that don't get greening. Um, maybe you can tell me that's happening, but I think a lot of this literature is based upon not samples of 120, but samples of six or eight. Uh, if, if I'm wrong, please tell me, because I would be very encouraged that I large I mean, we published something with 100 neighborhoods, and, right? So 100 control, clusters. Controlled assignment? Totally. Random assignment. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, for both now, for we have one that has appeared for the vacant lot greening. Uh, in Philadelphia and in Flint, 
and another one that has appeared now for um, very simple abandoned building fixes. Uh, right. In groups that get it and don't, er, everyone gets it at the end. It's uh, as as a matter of course, but over the course of the study. So, who funded that, and how hard was it to control the conditions so that the comparison neighborhoods didn't also develop? Uh, so, so who funded it? The NIH funded it. The CDC funded it. The U.S. Forest Service funded it. So, it was those three federal agencies. Um, and how hard was it? It was hard. Uh, I don't know that I would want to, I, I lost a lot of hair over that, so, uh, over both those studies. Hey. Uh, <laughs> maybe you've done more than I have, I don't know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's possible to do. It's possible to do, and the, the, the lighting trial also was a similar uh, uh, situation uh, with, I think, random assignment. I can't remember what the unit was, maybe the housing, uh, housing development or something along those lines. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's possible to do, and we've done it, and that's, by the way, for the non-researchers in the room, that's a, a very high level of science. I'm, I'm hesitant to call it the highest level, but it's a very high level of science. It's the same sort of science that was used to establish the vaccines that many of you took uh, over the course of the pandemic, right? Um, so that sort of random, con randomized control trial uh, was done on a number of these. Um, Again, with community, this all began with community buy-in and everything was checked out with the community and they were enthusiastic about it, so. So what is the state of the evidence for, well, first of all, I wanted to get back to the title of this uh, session, which has a word in it that you told me when we talked before that you would not use. So the word is blight. And I think, um, I, I've been cautioned, we probably published something with this maybe uh, a decade ago and were cautioned about it. It's a bit of a dog whistle uh, for certain groups to signal other things. Uh, so we try not to use that word any longer and it really is about disinvestment and disrepair, long-term disinvestment and disrepair. And when I say long-term, I mean decades. You can take, uh, for instance, redlining maps in all the cities I was just talking about and follow where the disrepair of buildings and land is right now, and they will match the redlining maps from the 1930s and 40s. So this is a very, it, it's very different, and I think the words we choose matter. Uh, and so uh, we've taken that out of our, and, and Wendell Pritchett, who was the provost of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, ha sat me down for this and, and told me about it. So I appreciate his writing on the topic. Okay. Abandoned, vacant, and speaking about what they are, abandoned buildings or vacant lots, because that's exactly what they are. Disrepair is another good word, or long-term disinvestment. That's sort of the way we're talking about it right now, trying not to use the word blight. Although, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna add to that and just say that cities around the nation still have uh, blight ordinances, which permit, so for any of the urban planners here, they do permit access to these spaces when the spaces become toxic. Um, but the word uh, has challenges to it. So before we continue with audience Q&A, I want to give each, all three of you a chance to say one thing that we didn't talk about before, I didn't ask about, that you need or an opportunity to say. Or you can pass. All right. Well, it's fair, Michelle, having to go for it again. Um, I guess I would say something based on the point that you that you just raised around individual level interventions. I think it's like you gotta call a spade a spade. That's white dominant culture. And we're talking about black and brown people who are communal by nature. And so trying to, it's like a square peg in a round hole or whatever they say. It's like you're trying to, it's very, it's isolating. It's like you're taking people who are a part of a community who thrives in, in like in the pack and saying or like operating like they are on their own like if you even if you think of like the criminal justice um, impact it's like you think it's this one person they committed a crime and we put them in jail we put their whole family in jail you know it's like the fan you somebody go to right you ever made that trip to Rikers okay Yo, you going to Rikers your family going to Rikers they gonna get on that bus they're going to take that mission and suffer through the experience of trying to see you if they go there. When a person is taken out of their community, they might be the breadwinner. They might, it just destabilizes 
um, the community. We don't, we don't function in these individual, every man for themselves, up by your bootstraps kind of manner that is very much the American way. That is not how black and brown people operate. That's not the community that we come from, the experience that we come from. And so, you know, while we're spending so much effort trying to do this individual whatever, we're ignoring the thing that, that literally could be the game changer for these folks and their families and their peer groups and their networks because this, this is how we function. It's like the investment is lopsided. The investment should be in the network, in the community, in the environment because that's who's gonna support the individual, individual whose behavior you're trying to change. But we don't do that. That's not the American way. It's like, it's just trying to create this um, individual penalty or individual impact um, on, a, on a person who is a part of a collective. It's like, I, I hope I'm making sense. But, but y'all know, y'all yeah. live in America, so one black person do something, then we all what? You said one white person do something, it's what? A lone wolf. It don't work, like, it's a weird, weird group. Yes, so let's, let's take the same negative uh, thing that we apply when we say, oh, one person do something, the whole group is like this. Let's flip that on its head. Since, since we function like a group and you know that we're part of a community and you make community level judgments, then let's make community level investment and try to do that and make it reverse down to the individuals. Okay. That's my two cents. Can you say something? Sure. Uh, you know, I would, um, while I, I see the, you know, the numbers, I mean, speak for themselves. I mean, you know, we have uh, what, 130 different, you know, intervention site clusters, right? And this one, a clinical trial with open lot greening, similar for abandoned buildings. Um, it's important to think, and also tying it to this, this term blight, uh, it, the bl term blight was used uh, to, to, um, give, you know, reason for these, you know, re redevelopment uh, initiatives, right, in the, in the 40s and 50s uh, to raise entire neighborhoods, right, to make way for stadiums and, you know, whatever, new developments. Um, and we have to, to also worry, although we're using different terms, vacant, abandoned, all that, you know, wh who benefits from fixing it up? from maintaining it. Um, so I, I, I want to you know, me mention as well the importance of thinking about the, the dangers of gentrification and, and dislocation. And, um, and we don't know, you know, and with this is a, you know, we're a market-based society. If you improve and fix up a neighborhood and some, and the white, young white professionals think it looks nice <laughs> and it's proximity to, you know, work, jobs, um, then you know they might want to move in, so so we don't yet know well, what on the market side you know what types of, of housing policies should be coupled and paired with neighborhood greening and lighting uh, you know uh, initiatives and, and interventions. It's important to keep that in mind. So last comment. Um, I just want to follow up on your statement about unofficial law, because I really like that, and I think it's been my experience, and we've documented it as well more broadly, that once you change a space, now I know that it's important, and when you add programs to that space to begin with, there's additional value, but I do want to put a plug in for changing the space as the as the basic substrate that's going to allow those programs to happen, and. Um, the unofficial law that proceeds and some, sometimes will do so because the space has been improved after decades uh, of neighbors calling, for, for, for instance, to have the space improved. Um, these spaces generate a lot of distrust in municipal government when you call, when perhaps there is a program in municipal government and you call and nothing happens. And that happens over and over and over again over the decades. So I think changing the space once it's greened once the building is improved, um, the neighbors, the unofficial law kicks in and the neighbors do not want it to go back to the way it was and they will act to do all kinds of things to prevent it. They will not allow things to occur on the space uh, that were occurring before. They will step in to, to do that. 
there's a lot of things. There's a, there's a person who drove around a couple of the cities in New Orleans and in Philadelphia um, and uh, looked at what was left on the spaces just to get a sense of how the spaces were being used. And of course, there's barbecues. There's children's uh, playground equipment, these sorts of things. There's been, we've apparently, that I have pictures of horses grazing on a couple of the newly green spaces. And there's even been a wedding or two on the newly green spaces as, as the, on the extreme. But anyway, so I do think the unofficial law can't be uh, un understated, the importance of that. And that is without you know, any sort of municipal structure or, or any sort of policing that occurs with that. That is just positive benefit that comes from these spaces once the actual place is changed. Okay. Yeah, let's have some questions from the audience and um, introduce yourself before you ask your question there in the back. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I am here representing my agency, and so, uh, but I, I, I didn't, you know, I'm not in, no, I'm necessarily, but I'm going to bring it home. Uh, yeah, thank you for bringing that to my attention, and I serve on a neighborhood advisory council for the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society with a disabilities advocate, and I, I love, I'm learning so much from her right now. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, so, yes, I'm, my mind is broadened and I'm, I'll voice that, that message as much as I can. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. Yes, in the front. My name is Tira Scott, and I'm the founder of the National Clean Water Collective. For the past seven years, we've been doing work in Flint, Michigan. Um, so I was asking you about that because the people there also call it blight, uh, blighted community. So that's interesting to learn, and I'd, I'd love to share that. But I wanted to find out, um, the other thing I wanted to share is that when you're building up a community, like what you're talking about, is that you also increase the property value in a community. Um, and we've noticed that in Flint and, um, and even Newark. Um, but I wanted to know if you guys have heard of the Blue Zones Project. I think it's important that that project, because um, they've gotten um, data from Gallup and um, they are working with uh, experts in the field and they're transforming communities. Um, they started internationally. It was actually endorsed by the National Geographic. But we're looking to implement that uh, project in Flint, 
and also New York City. Um, the goal is to create a thriving community throughout all sectors, including food, you know, education, um, the environment, all, all those things. Um, and um, create, well, first of all, get the buy-in from the community and have the community run the programs and, and the organizations, and they actually get paid to do this work, right? And they have more of a vested interest in doing this work. Um, and it, it works. They've done it in 78 communities across the United States. We're working right now um, to, as I said, get it in Flint and also in New York City. We've got to start small, but we need buy-in from these corporate do people that have crazy dollars that can invest in programs like this that can um, basically sort of leverage the work that you've already been doing and build on that and actually see impact. Places like Fort Worth, Texas has seen um, impact in four years from just implementing that, that uh, particular program and it was actually prior to COVID and during COVID they were thriving. As communities like us, we were, you know, we were sinking, but they were thriving because they'd already implemented the idea of Blue Zones. So I encourage um, uh, the, this sort of the research of Blue Zones project, and I'd love to bring the VP of the company to you to talk about that. I think it's critical um, around what you guys have been doing already to implement this in New York and other places. Any comments or reactions? Sure, I, I think it's absolutely fascinating. I'd love to hear about Fort Worth, my goodness. So Dallas, Texas actually reached out a couple of years pa uh, in the past and devoted, I think, $10 million to, to, to starting up a program there. But for Blue Zones, I think Michelle and I have done a little work on, um, now I don't know if this relates, but to, on stormwater recapture. So there's an intersection here of climate change for a lot of cities um, that, Basically, cities are over-concretized. I don't know if you've been following, like, like parking lots are a huge problem. So to lift that concrete and create opportunities for water to come back in does reduce the, into the earth, does reduce flooding and all sorts of other things. But it also introduces new green space to places that would not have it before. And we've looked at that a little bit. And there are also uh, benefits in terms of uh, violence reduction. Uh, for those uh, stormwater recapture installations. So, I, but I'm not sure exactly what you mean when you say, perhaps you wanna say just a, another word about blue, blue zones and blue space. Cause when I think of blue zones, actually I think of it. You think of water, right? But no, it's actually, it's, it's deeper than that, but I'd love to share. And then the other thing is in Flint, they have a thing called Porch Fest. I would love to see it happen oh. here. <clears throat> Porch Fest is pretty dope because they, um, basically the community, like you mentioned, um, they get involved and they're building up people's homes. What, like they may focus on it for a week and they'll build up like Grandma Elda or whatever her name is, you know what I mean? Her home and they'll beautify it and then you'll see it happening in the next week. The next week they're focused on another home in that community. And it's a beautiful concept because like you said, it's important to see the community working together. And I'd right. love to see that happen in New York City. Okay, um, in the middle there. Poverty. 
Yeah, sure. I mean, just simply, we had two uh, interventions, intervention arms or, or groups, uh, and and it was you know we measured change, we measured change in violence or crime, uh, you know, before compared to after an intervention, and the intervention was in the contractor led. Uh, uh, you know, program or right. It it is local jobs. So often, right? They're they're hiring. The city is hiring um, local residents to um, to do this this work, the cleaning and greening. Um, so you're right. That intervention has multiple sort of levels, but yeah. Um, and then on the community side, uh, that intervention was community groups. They weren't getting paid individually, but they were getting resources to do the intervention, um, to invest in you know buying fruit trees or you know plant whatever they wanted to plant. Um, so, so it was a change, uh, and we weren't necessary. We weren't comparing you know just the greening versus jobs and plus greening and you know whatever community engagement plus greening um, it was sort of in wrapped up I guess in in the two interventions it is a great question though and there is a, a, a new couple of NIH studies that are going to seek to disentangle that those exact things and are going to have separate arms that don't have any kind of place-based intervention uh, and compare them to arms that are economic interventions and investments in the community more directly and see, to basically do a comparative effectiveness trial of the two. So it's a great question. Was there someone on this side? Yeah. yeah. also creates a risk of communities being left out of discussions and of gentrification as these, as these places. I mean, in New York City, a lot of the areas around the city by the water are public housing because in the past, I think they were seen as being less desirable places. So how do we create processes that include community and decision makings around environmental projects? And how do we think about navigating this in a way that avoids issues with gentrification? <laughs> Is that a me question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to try. Okay, let me give you a couple answers. And I think New York City, Boston, San Francisco can be outliers to my answers, but I'm gonna try to answer it for you for the other 40 legacy cities that uh, are a little bit different. Um, I, I think what I was saying before is making basic, inexpensive structural changes is different, and so that's one way, as opposed to making these uh, luxury installations, which New York is famous, infamous for, right? Um, so I think that's one step that I've seen and, and that, that we've studied, for instance, property taxes. So I know, uh, and looking at what happens to property taxes after these inexpensive installations, again, building the park of a thousand pieces, property taxes do not go up. And in fact, in some neighborhoods, they even went down. So and many of the spaces, the vast majority in the, the latest study we published, it's something to the tune of 97% of the spaces remain as they are. They don't then get developed into some luxury property. Um, so again, I think there's, there's an, uh, an installation question of what you actually put in the space that might be a defense against this. The, the other thing to think about, and I do think New York City thinks about this, um, in Philadelphia and in Detroit, there are um, basically, I guess, the equivalent of rent controls. So recognizing multi-generational residents and protecting, especially their pr property tax increases and rent increases in those spaces to ensure that continued generations of those folks can stay in the neighborhood. And in those cities, there's been some study and th that has worked uh, for a number of, of neighborhoods that, the, that sort of uh, controls of costs for the neighborhood. To, to do what I think many of us define gentrification as, and that is forced out migrations for economic, for changing economic conditions. So try to unseat that. I'm gonna give you the 99 cent store answer to the million dollar question. You just do, 
it's not like we spend a lot of time conversing about like how do we do if there is not political will to do it it won't get done and if the political will is not inherently there then now now I'm back in my advocacy bag then we the people who live there have to make them do it um, and the way we do that is of course exercising our voice at the ballot box it's holding your elected official accountable to represent the interests of the people who live in your area if we're talking about a neighborhood like yeah, Red Hook. Um, you know, there there are a bunch of disenfranchised people in Red Hook who feel like, why am I going to engage in the political process when nobody gives a damn about me or how I'm living over here? But those are the people for those of us who uh, who who care to exercise that kind of influence over uh, the political world. Advocacy groups, nonprofit. We have to mobilize those folks to speak up to take action against that happening in their neighborhood. Otherwise, what's the incentive for a corporation or for the city of New York to do that? What is their incentive to care? They're letting people live however they're living right down the street. They don't uh, care. And that, that's why the um, mobilizing, organizing, and advocacy piece of MAP was so important. That's why people are like, you guys use city government money to hire organizers? Yes, we did. Because we needed to, to organize against us, technically us, as the people who work for the institution because these folks do stuff under pressure. Otherwise, they're just comfortable, they do what they wanna do. Yeah. So we can do one more, and I, I can't see your face, but I see the silhouette of a hat. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone, my name is Ken Lester, and I work at the Board of Selectmen. I have a two-year program and an insert certificate, uh, and I work in Louisiana. Uh, my question- That's three Vera Institutes in a row. I don't know yeah, if we can- I'm answer but I do want to say just one thing to that that's facts but the research community also has to hold itself accountable for going after the big bags to prove stuff that we already know and to make it for making RCTs and all of this the gold standard of what it, like your research institutions are getting money that could literally be going to do work that we all freaking know because we have eyes needs to be done but however the research community accepts those bags and goes and do these long, exhaustive studies that their friends have already done on subjects that their friends have already talked about. It's like be accountable also, you know? Say, this has already been uh, proven and done. Actually, we'd like to do some research on, I don't know, something that community members told you they needed information about. But I think that there is some accountability to be shared there by the research yeah. community. And they publish the results in a journal you can't read unless you pay for it. <laughs> Come on, somebody. All right. This, I wish we could go for another hour, but that's our I time. I can't respond? Oh. <laughs> so, you know, I told you about two RCTs, and those were after a series of what we call observational studies. That is, we just observed what cities were already doing, and the community of researchers, but also the community of policymakers were not stepping forward. Right? They were not accepting for a number of questions about well, how do you tell the difference between two different, you know, how do you know it actually works? So we then stepped up and went to the next level. 
Now, that money did provide, uh, as I said, changed housing and did provide uh, greening and new spaces to many, many communities. Um, it did also pay for the salaries of all the researchers that worked on that, on that stuff, so I'm not gonna deny that to you. Uh, but those RCTs, it, it, so it's amazing that the observational work without the RCTs, where we weren't, that those were very inexpensive studies, those were not changing minds. To, to your question, I mean, there were policymakers that did not, their ears did not prick up until they saw the RCTs. So I'm just, I, I'm putting that out there for you because this is, this is a phenomenal question, and it's a question we've gotten before. I, I do think we need scientific study, but I will side with you. I think absolutely. It does not necessarily need to be a long, drawn-out, randomized control trial. We can learn quite a bit very quickly with a lot of other studies. If we can get the policymakers to then, and city council and everybody else, to put the money behind it with those other sorts of studies. All right. Thank you very much, everyone.